Hi, welcome to Write More Late. I'm Sarah with the Midwest Writing Center, and today I am super, super excited to introduce to you. <laughs> I have just lost your bio. <laughs> um, Aida Zalelian, who is an author and storyteller and teacher, and um, we're really lucky to have her upcoming leading a couple of three workshops. Um, so we're going to have, I, I expect, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun here today for folks who maybe haven't watched this program before. We're going to do an interview, then I'll give updates on the Midwest Writing Center, and then we will move into a five-minute free rate. Aida, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is great. I um, I told you I found your book via via recommendation. Uh, the legacy of lost things but you have another one coming out do you want to will you please tell us about the the next one you have coming out yeah so in about a year actually it's going to be another year um i wrote a book called all the ways we lied which is about a dysfunctional armenian family set in queens new york and it is three sisters parents so they're a fully formed family, um, but there are a lot of complications because the um, father who is holding the family together pretty much is the one who um, is diagnosed with a terminal illness. And we see what happens to each of the characters and the relationships between them when that happens. That is what the story is, the heart of the story is about. <laughs> this elevator, <laughs> this elevator speech has been given before. <laughs> no, no. I mean, actually, you're the first one to ask me, like, live, like, what is this about? No one has interviewed me about this yet, actually. No. Oh, um, I was well, just... It, you, you knew, and that's promising. <laughs> <laughs> Would be probably not great if you were like, eh, you know, it's a book. <laughs> um what, what was that one called can you repeat that please all the ways we lied all the ways we lied that's I, I feel like those titles go together did you are you the are you able to title your own works yes yeah Most I know authors few, are. yeah I, I know a few people who like have titles they really care about and then the publisher changed them which actually usually is I can't think of a time when it wasn't for the better <laughs> but um I, your your titles sound sound like friends thank you they are I guess they are yeah now did I see I could I could be wrong about this did I see that the legacy of lost things is a sequel so it's yeah so I wrote a young adult novel because the legacy of lost things is about um an Armenian family and the teenager runs away and the novel opens up with the parents. Um, the, the, the girl has run off. And so the young adult novel that I wrote, The Hollowing Moon, which was not published because a lot of publishers and agents were, were very concerned about the ending and the way that it ended or the way that it didn't end. And so that was not published and that was written strictly through the perspective of a teenager who ran away. Whereas The Legacy of Lost Things, the sequel is from all perspectives. Well, that's really cool. Yeah, so that one was published with Bleeding Heart publications in 2015. And it's funny because recently uh, my cousin said to me, you know, it's, it's tough to end you know, it's tough the way that you ended because you're not resolving anything. I said, I'm aware of that. <laughs> so we talked about that a little bit and why I made that choice. You know, I was reading, I don't want to have that conversation. I don't want to give spoilers to anyone. Um, but I've seen two authors recently who, one was an interview with Tom, um, Tommy Orange and the other was an essay, like a micro essay by John Green in which they said, you know, I talk about the things I talk about, not because of metaphors and not because I have some deep, you know, figurative thing I want people to think about, but because this is what happens in life. And I think 
there's a population of readers out there who who want resolution, who read for who read more for entertainment than um and like comfort than for you know I don't know I read because reading is my home <laughs> and I don't necessarily need resolution or denouement if well if if the story is right if it's true to the story um but I think that we see that a lot where people are just really offended by a lack of resolution when sometimes life doesn't have resolution and, and often doesn't have any kinds of closure to to small situations or big ones yeah and that's sort of I mean I could give away the ending for the YA book that wasn't published because to this girl she sort of wants to get away from her family forever she really really does and she has this spoiled friend who treats it more like an adventure thinking they're going to go back home and so these two drive all the way to New Mexico and I actually drove all the way to New Mexico um to write that book and and you know because I'd never driven to New Mexico and my point is at the end of the novel her friend is just like all right let's go back and she's like I'm not doing that and the novel ends with her sitting at a bus stop in Arizona and watching her friend get on the bus and her staying behind and that's how it ends and that's I think what agents and publishers had a big problem with I mean, I guess I get it, but I wouldn't change it. I I mean, that's, I'm really glad that you have that um, loyalty to the, to the story. That means something to me personally. I, I mean, having not, having not read it, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know what they're worried about, but I guess it's the message that, you know, if, if this ends up in the hands of high schoolers. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. YA, um, as a, as a genre is, was created for marketing. So it has, because of that marketing probably created a lot of like, what message are we sending? But then you see things like perks of being a wallflower isn't shelved with YA it's shelved with fiction. Is that right? Yeah. I actually noticed that the other day. <laughs> I know I, uh, I when I bought it, it was in fiction, but there wasn't like a large YA section in in those days. Uh, but I just noticed it the other day and that memory came back to me. Wow, I didn't know that. And I should because I'm also an English teacher. So I should technically know that. Interesting. The I mean, it's it, yeah, it's interesting. It's a, a pet a pet topic of mine is the the marketing of children's and young adult literature <laughs> oh wow I did not know that that's very cool the um it's yeah I mean right so we usually think YA the main character is a teenager but like we wouldn't say the same thing about To Kill a Mockingbird where the main character is seven <laughs> you know we wouldn't put that in children's lit it's just interesting that's a really cool point. I need to think about that as a teacher now. Thank you. <laughs> hey, anytime. Anytime you want, you want to talk about yeah. YA, I am here. <laughs> I'm also, you know, um, in that vein, I know I'm, I'm going off script here. Um, you know, we're seeing more difficult topics dealt with in, you know, by the by the big five. Uh, publishers but we're still not seeing them I don't know appreciated and that's interesting because it's not like at the writing center we run a program for um youth ages 15 to 19 and every once in a while somebody is super concerned about the content but these these people are writing their own stories, right? These these young people are writing their own stories. And um, so obviously the content is appropriate to them if it's their life, um, but it's always adults who are concerned about the content. What kind of books come to mind when you say that? Do you have any pieces of literature? Oh, we, so in our internship, we publish our interns. They spend the summer 
um, writing, workshopping, editing, designing, and developing a, a literary magazine. Wow, really that cool. is a great program. Yeah, and it's paid. Yeah, it's it's really cool. <laughs> it is my favorite part of the year. We also have our conference in the summer. It's just, let me um, go on and keep advertising my job. <laughs> uh -huh. I like it. Okay, so um, for... For, for folks who think that I am super predictable, and I probably am, um, I want to say I, I have not met Aida before, um, but I did find her work um, because a friend recommended it, and a friend recommended it because, quote, um, I had never seen myself in a book before, um, yeah, which is really, which is really real, and we see that a lot in the media, or we don't see much in the media as um, culturally specific stories go. Um, so wow. there was the, the segue. Um, so I found you, I got excited because um, someone was telling the story of young Armenian life in, in today, in this day and age. Um, and so I'm, I'm giving this build up to you're telling very specific stories when you tell cultural stories. And that's probably true of everyone, but um, I know well how small um, the Armenian community is. <laughs> um, and so it feels, I mean, it feels like mine, right? But it feels, um, it feels ever smaller when it's not like a large population, right? Um, is is that scary? I know it led into a yes or no question, but there's more. <laughs> you mean in what way? I mean, there's a lot scary about it. So do you mean about exposing Armenian culture through a family dynamic? Um, do you feel like like it's scary because I may be exposing myself? Because there's a lot to be scary about. Well, I, um, I meant a little more broadly, uh, knowing that you will be that you will be recognized and seen because there's just not that much out there. Um, and then also that you're, you're not, you're not talking about it in like a happy church setting either. Yeah. You know, when I started writing short stories about the Armenian culture, um, they were actually very funny because um, I would really make fun of like the stereotypes of I would get into trouble for things like that. Um, stereotypes of not being able to move out of the house until you get married. You know, the stereotype of like the obedient son, you know, attached to his mother's apron string, you know, that kind of thing. But in this way, um, it is a little bit scary, but truthfully, I didn't think anyone would, re would read I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I just write and I don't think about, I don't assume that anyone's gonna really read it. I know that sounds really naive. Maybe it's a self-protective thing that I do, but I know that for all the ways we lied, um, it is really scary to have that one out there because I established myself somewhat with the legacy of lost things. And so for this one, you know, it's basically shattering that perfect picture of the Armenian family. And, you know, I feel like I grew up, my peers all came from perfect Armenian families, except for mine. And it was extremely isolating. Uh, I felt I felt the marked difference between myself and my peers. And I didn't talk about my home life, which was not a happy uh, childhood um, and adolescence. And I just wonder if even any Armenians will be able to connect with this because I kind of assume that I'm one of the only that came from that kind of family. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh. I'm meandering with my response. <laughs> Sorry. That's no, I am. I'm not delighted by your answer. That was the word that came that was going to come out of my mouth. I'm just used to saying that word. Um, I'm I'm comforted to hear this. I um. I mean, obviously the right thing to do is to write what comes, right? Not to think about an audience until 
an audience exists. But I don't know. I have just a massive ego and I'm always assuming I'm going to be famous with the next sentence I write. <laughs> but you know, I um I wrote an I wrote an essay a few years back and uh a family member was really offended by it. Not an Armenian family member, interestingly. Um why were they offended? I'm curious. Um it, <laughs> <laughs> how to say this without outing people um they they thought that it was an un, that I made an unfair depiction of my family mm. which also like was not disparaging what it what the piece was about was my own identity in a diaspora in which I don't feel connected um but what I found from that was a lot of people from immigrant families who felt the same way um, and I didn't feel connected and therefore I assumed I was alone. Right. Uh, so my point is that you're certainly not the only one, what we see, what I see, especially in just in any, in any diaspora is everyone has to have the perfect family on the outside. And I think that's why, um, so many people it was it was one group chat um but so many people simultaneously recommended your book because they all felt home in it um that's really and i think i mean that's what stories are for yeah and you know this book is going to come out and right now i'm in the, i'm almost done with a collection of short stories about armenians and they're written through very, very different perspectives so that I could really provide a broader spectrum and not just, I mean, there's a lot of family dynamic in there, cultural expectations, assimilation, immigration, it's all in there. But I try to, to provide a, a broader, a broader um, perspective of things. So that way, you know, I mean, it's great that I wrote all the ways we lied and I'm really happy it's getting published. Um, but I think that the short story collection will just create more texture <laughs> that may not be there in all the ways we lied. I also wanted to mention, um, are you familiar with Michael Barakiva's writing? No. He's a, he's a Jewish Armenian. Um, and he write, he writes YA, he writes plays. He's a playwright primarily. Oh, cool. Um, and his first book um was about trying to navigate uh being gay in an Armenian family and the process of coming out and how that how that pans out. Um and the family is from Jersey and they have to drive, you know, three hours to church to go to New York every day, or I don't know. Uh, probably not three hours jersey's not very big um and they wouldn't go to church every day that would be a lot but um it's certainly not about a happy family i mean um happy families are alike right <laughs> no def definitely so um and my friend nancy agavian i don't know if you're familiar with her work but she wrote a nonfiction. A piece a long while ago called Me as Her Again, which if you say it fast enough, is really me Aseragan. Like if you say it really fast, it basically means gay in Armenian. Uh, but if you break it down phonetically in English, it is um, me as her again. And it's about her experiences growing up and being bisexual in an Armenian family. So there, there may be a lot more out there that I'm that I'm aware of, honestly. I've just looked her up. I was not uh, familiar with her, but also I thought that you were like mispronouncing my last name when you said Agabian. <laughs> oh no, it's Nancy Agabian. Um, yeah, she actually her book is she has another book coming out. I actually uh, interviewed her and um, working on getting that piece published. But that's so clever. Yeah, but she she is um, she is a fantastic writer, and so she's she came out with a novel that's releasing in May called uh, "The Fear of Large and Small." The fear of small, large and small nations, or small and large nations. I should know this, but I don't. Um, well, I can't see the full title, but definitely "Large and Small" is in the yeah. Beginning. There it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting my words mixed up, um, but that's comforting to know. 
Um, and I wrote that that writer's name down because I don't know of that many. And I, yeah, I'm going to get a lot of heat for lots of things. <laughs> um, you know, especially all the ways we lied. Uh, that, that novel, I think I'm going to get a lot of heat for that. Uh, because I think Armenians are a traditional culture and very protective and private about um, the way that we are portrayed. But it unnerves me, you know, the squeaky clean. It just unnerves me. So I had to pop that balloon a little bit. <laughs> well, that's uh, really great for me to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um. I lost my question. Sorry. Okay. So, um, what advice do you have for folks who want to tell stories from their, from their culture? Um, I want to, I want to make sure that I'm saying, you know, whatever that means to you. Yeah. So I look at culture and the way I'm going to be approaching it is just the idea that culture really is a way of life. I mean, it could be gay culture, you know, it doesn't have to be rooted in a setting, a, a location, um, an origin. It could be a religion. It could be culture, the, the connotative, right? What we think of when we think of the word culture. But what advice I would give is to really um, write from a place that's really important to you that is a source of contention, right? That That really gives you a makes you feel like this inner conflict or turmoil that is really important to address in your writing, whether you do it through dialogue or setting or how, however, and that's sort of what we're going to be outlining in next week's workshop on Thursday. That's a really good segue too into the other workshops that you'll be, that you'll be leading. Um, let's see, you've got family stories and then vignettes. Yeah, snapshot snore stories like how to write snapshot moments that are self-contained but that you could really turn into I mean I remember writing a whole story but it was in snapshots it just captured moments but the narrative thread was very very strong in other words there was no guessing it wasn't fake it was not experimental and so that that would be that that's the third workshop I'll be doing yeah and the family story is a trickier one because, you know, it's like, you're, are you really writing about your family underneath it all? And is that okay? And it should be okay. And why is that not okay? Is it because someone's going to read it? And to that I say, and I'm going to quote Anne Lamott. And I remember finding her quote and feeling comforted. And she said, if people, I think she said, if people are so offended or concerned about what you write about them, maybe they shouldn't have behaved so poorly. And when it comes to writing family stories, you just need, again, find, like you need to, you know, when you write something, there's like, has to be a fire underneath it. Like, why are you writing this? Why are you writing it? Because if you don't know why you're writing it, you shouldn't be. I love that. Yes. If you, I mean, if you're bored, you shouldn't be here. Uh -huh. uh, but beyond that, you know, that I, I am one of those people who makes the assumption that like, and this isn't based in reality. And this is also not true of my own work. It used to be true of my own work. Um, but I'm one of those people who just, for whatever reason, makes the assumption that the main character is always the writer and that's just not the case uh um <laughs> but but yeah it's okay if it's okay if it is we we're telling stories based on the stories that need to be told from our from our perspective and we can't i mean persona exists as a as a form right we can write the persona piece but we're always going to be writing what we believe even if it's taking on someone else's identity as we do it yeah and if people are really uncomfortable writing non like they they feel like they can't tap into the truth of it unless they're writing nonfiction, just write it as write it and put all the names in 
And if you, you know, you can change the names later, you could change some of the circumstances later. When it comes to family stories, it's very blurry because my assumption is that anybody who is signing up for that class has their own family story to tell. And they have to find the more most comfortable way to tell that story so that they could really, you know, tell it. It's like wearing the most comfortable pair of sneakers if you're gonna go for that tough run. Like what is comfortable to do here so that you could really write this without censoring yourself and being scared that someone's gonna read it and find themselves in there. And guess what? If somebody wants, they can always find themselves in your story. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's also auto fiction is a thing now. It didn't used to be, you know, like a proper genre where we're just, the authors are just saying in a very straightforward way, I fictionalized my life, have at it. Um, you know, that's welcomed now. Um, we also, so we have um, a writer's retreat that we sponsor. Um, and a couple of years ago, 2021, Jeffrey Wolf was the, was the winner of that. And his project was, he's writing short stories based on his family. And those, I think probably, I asked this, but I don't remember now. Um, those come from, you know, I have a memory and I think this would make a good story. And sometimes stories are better when you embellish them. Sometimes the the greater truth comes out when you expand on, you know, the 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 events as they happened. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. And I think workshops in general could be really helpful because sometimes there's just so much chaos going on in your mind that sometimes it's just helpful for someone to say like just write this let's just keep it simple let's just write this i have to do that with myself when i'm approaching any story that i write it's like just calm down you know and one thing i say is like what is what are you really trying to say in this story what is this story really about just write down one sentence of what it's really about because if you can pin that down you got your story. You did actually half your work. I like that. I think that's really good advice. Thank you. I had been thinking, um, I sort of have to convince myself of one of two things. It depends what I'm writing. If I, I do a lot of epistolary writing, um, letters, narrative letters, and I have to believe that I'm going to send this letter when I, when I write it. I don't know if that's psychologically revealing uh, what it means. <laughs> um, but then when I'm writing something else, particularly like an essay, nonfiction situation, I have to believe no one will see it. And that's okay. Like I know, I know that I write and will want an audience eventually. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you can't write. I don't, I mean, I can't write write I can't write correctly I can't write right I just write it r-i-g-h-t is the is the correct word to use next <laughs> if I'm not doing it for me yeah it's really between yourself and the piece of paper or the screen um and I think that everybody I think that writers can lose sight of that I know that I can I remember um a couple of months ago, I was having just a hard time with something. I was very, very upset about something. I really was. And, you know, writing a short story just takes a lot of work. Um, even writing a poem takes a lot of work. There's so much control in every word. And my sister reminded me and she said, why don't you just write it out? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, like in a journal or something, you know, and I haven't journaled in years. So why don't you just write it down? I'm like, oh my God, I totally forgot how yeah, that's an option. <laughs> I'm like, I could just write down the way I feel on a piece of paper and I, you know, and it was really great. And I did it and it, and it turned actually into a poem and I would never try to get it published because it was so heightened in its subjectivity that nobody can understand about me. 
and it was so helpful. And I forgot, I somehow, somehow lost sight of why I write. And, but that's where it all started. It was just between me and the sheet of paper with my pencil. So you can't think of things like, is the audience gonna like it? It's, just do that later, do that later. Sorry, I had a, thought I was gonna burp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a question. Uh, hey, Tom. Uh, Tom says, how much should a writer be concerned about offending someone? I think you, I think you've sort of just answered that for us, but I'd love to hear your answer anyway. How much? Well, I mean, if you're literally um, writing about the person and using their name or like passive aggressively changing their name just a little bit, you should be really worried because that's, that sounds like you're just trying to, it's like vengeance writing, right? But I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be too concerned. It depends on why you're writing it. If there's a reason that goes beyond, you know, something selfish, then I, I just think you should write. It doesn't matter. If you don't, if you think about that stuff, nobody's gonna write anything. Think about everything that's been written out there and all sorts of people who've been offended by it. And think about if that writer hadn't written that thing. Think about someone like David Sedaris. Did you read the last thing he wrote? Oh my God, <laughs> that was amazing. I've only read uh, Me Talk Pretty one day, but yeah, he is not He is not worried about who he hurts. Read his very last piece about the passing of his father. It's It's delightfully brutal. Yeah, that's my answer. But if there's like a follow-up question to that, I'd love to answer it. Maybe there's like a more clarifying question, a follow-up question to what I just said. Yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, based on, I, I know Tom, um, who asked the question, at least I think, I didn't look at the last name. Yes, I do. Um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if maybe we're thinking about I think me and you are thinking about um, like the people in our lives who, I mean, I've never written anything that wouldn't offend someone. Uh, <laughs> it just is what it is. Yeah. Um, but if we're looking then instead at like being offensive, like to great right. swaths of people, that's different. Right. Are you, are you, like, are you, is this, out of the dignity of being a writer like are you a dignified writer is that where it's coming from like is there dignity in what you're writing or is this just to tear somebody up because I will tell you I got into a lot of trouble once a lot of trouble uh want to hear a story yes okay she may even be what no she won't be watching this <laughs> it's okay um, you don't have to no, no, I don't care. I'll tell it. See, this is what I mean. Tom, are you listening? This is what I mean. I'm just not <laughs> writing the story. I'm telling it. It's a story within a story. So I had a friend in college who was a couple of years younger than me. And uh, we just had a very, very strange uh, relationship, very strange friendship and had a falling out. And, you know, it was just a really crazy time for me. And years and years later, I decided, you know what? Um, I'm sure she's more mature now. I'm more mature. Let me give her a ring. And, you know, it's almost like eight years later. And so long story short, I started teaching that year and we hung out and it seemed like we put our immaturity aside. And then she decided that she wanted to be a teacher. And then she decided that she was going to apply at the school I was at and also uh, infiltrate my friend circle. Do you see where this is going? We're talking about women who are in their late twenties. And so we reached a point where I had to really cut the friendship off because I saw where this was going. And for the life of me, I didn't understand why she was doing this, but I was angry. So I wrote a story called The Festering that was published by Sucker Lit. It was That's a, a good title. Now called the festering and I will I promise you and if Tom is still listening I vow to you 
that I never thought anybody would read this story. I promise. I assume nobody, why would anyone read anything that I have to write? I don't know. I just don't think that anyone would write. I don't know why I think that. I think people published it, but no one's going to see it. So I don't know who reads that. <laughs> no. So I changed her name by three letters, the ending of her name by three letters. And basically, it's a teenage, toxic teenage relationship where my character ends up outing her at the end of the story and be beating the daylights out of her at a party. And so, really long story short, although she and I were not on speaking terms, I wrote this story, it got published, and she found it and she read it. And she confronted me at work. At work? Yeah, we still worked together. She got a job where I worked. Also, she like, was, that's kind of wild. Did she have, like, a Google alert on you? She was on my tail. She went to the gym I went to, and everyone was dazzled by how charming she was. Nobody understood that, like, there's something psychopathic going on. So I, and she was so offended. She screamed at me. She yelled at me. You wrote a story about me. But I will promise you that it was not like um, a revenge story. And it got published. You got to just do what you want to do. Uh, oh, wow. Tom has replied to us. He's thinking about the changing standards of political correctness. Mm -hmm. um, do you, you, you can speak to that. That's a slippery one because I think that political correctness has its varying degrees. So that's a tough one because of the subject. What, you know, what's the subject? What uh, is it about minority and how to approach that? That's a tough one. And I don't have to contend with that because of what I write about. <laughs> I think there's, um, there's, there's a couple of like safe things, right? Where we can it's best to only tell stories that you can tell, right? Don't tell someone else's story. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you can pick up like Stephen King and because he's been writing for decades and you read his old stuff and you're like, oh, buddy, you can't say that. But he's Stephen King. And he has grown and changed with time. And we've all seen that. We can, you know, go to his Twitter and see, you know, where he stands on issues. And, you know, the fact that he. OK, um, I started reading. I didn't finish reading. I do this a lot. I'll pick up a book and read three pages and then forget I picked it up. Um, I started reading the book Misery recently, which I think was only in the 80s. I don't think it was that long ago. Um, I'm not going to look that up. Um, but the opening page has the narrator a uh, cishet white man comparing receiving medicine to rape um and you're like there are two options here one you are like way out of your league buddy or two this is really <laughs> what this what this middle-aged cishet white man thinks rape is you know um and I think that if you talk to Stephen King about that today, I'm not his friend. I don't know this for sure. He would be like, yikes, that was out of line. Right. And I think that's good enough. We do the best we can when when we do it. And in doubt, there are, there are people out there called sensitivity readers now. I mean, I have a friend who I think, was she Malaysia? She went to Thailand. I don't know. I forget what she was writing about, but she found a sensitivity reader from Malaysia to read these this group of poems that she wrote i'm pretty sure it was poetry and uh that's out there too but I, I know how sensitive is too sensitive it's a really no pun intended touchy topic but it really <laughs> is it really is i'm gonna add i'm gonna add this to my to my list i don't know how one finds sensitivity readers usually when i say hey how do you find a blank someone says twitter and um, before we went live, we talked about how neither, how neither of us are, are much on Twitter. Um, 
but that's something that that I hear about a lot is people people want to know how to get beta readers or sensitivity readers, um, which is awesome. We should care, uh, but I don't know how to do it. I you know I I will tell you like fa Facebook, believe it or not, is a fantastic source because there are writing groups and you could just jump into your local writing group. Really, that's how I found beta readers for my novel. By the way, as well as my book coach, I used a book coach for, um, for all the ways we lied. And I'm sure if you just jumped in there, everyone would be willing to help you because it's this wonderful supportive community. Yeah. I think there's also probably some difficulty with making sure you're finding people who are not like you, mm. which is, I mean, much easier on the internet than in real life. You know, you mm -hmm. could say, I'm looking for someone who is not of my demographic background. Right. It solved that problem that I created. True. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay. I will go back to what excites you about no i already asked you that um <laughs> okay i'll change it a little bit um no you still answered it even if i change it <laughs> i talk too much well no it was um what excites you about cultural stories and i was like well why don't i ask why we why you I say we a lot I taught preschool briefly and it just never left my vocabulary um you know why the family dynamic but you answered both of those questions already um so we'll move on to vignettes uh snapshots I'm sorry I just love the word vignette it makes me feel fancy uh, <laughs> um so you said that you wrote a whole um a whole project using snapshots to form the narrative yeah. Can you either talk a little bit about the process of doing that or I can ask more specific questions? No, I mean, and it's a really easy process and it, it's a very satisfying one because the structure is so simple and I'm really looking forward to teaching that. So I'm personally invested because this is what I'm doing for my, my biggest, like my, my longest age count project. Um, oh, wow. And so I really am very excited about that class. So I wrote a short, it's, I guess, a short story, nonfiction piece, piece called A Slow Thawing. What's it called? And a Slow Thawing. Thawing. It's a thaw, right. And it was published by West, uh, West Texas Literary Review. I'm pretty sure it's somewhere over here. Anyway, it was basically, I mean, it's, it's, it's a dark, sad piece because um, my stepfather, who I was very close to, and he was a translator and an editor. And he oh. was my, uh, yeah, and he was my mentor. And he was one of the most well-known translators of Armenian literature of our lifetime. And I grew up with this mammoth of an intellectual and he died two weeks before I gave birth to my daughter. And I never, I don't think I ever got over it because I had to suspend my grief so that I could enjoy my motherhood. And so the overarching idea is that it's a very slow thawing. Like I'm not, I'm light year, like it feels to me like if I talk about it long enough, right? I could get myself worked up, but it really feels like it happened a year ago. And so the entire, uh, the body of work, I'd say is about 3000 words. And it's just the moments, these like big moments, right? Snapshots like contained, and then it moves to the next moment and the next moment. And, but then there's the linear thread of the actual story. Right. And they're not necessarily actually it's not chronological. I shouldn't say that. It is I was I was gonna say I was trying to figure out how to word it that it probably doesn't have to be chronological. It doesn't as long as it makes sense. The placement has to be very careful. So I open up with after the fact. 
and just me with this newborn hanging off of me. And two months afterwards, our dog died. We had to put our dog down. And we had this, our dog champ was like this 80 pound bulldog. So my stepfather passes away. I give birth to my daughter. And then we find out that our bulldog has mouth cancer. And at this point, he's really sick. And so the whole thing opens up with me putting this eight month old in a carrier and me and my, my husband had to go back to work and me trying to get this dog out of the house because I need to walk him. And how the timing of bottle feeding her and giving him his medicine to stretch his life is exactly this at the same time. And meanwhile, I'm dealing with the grief. So it's very intense. Sorry, I, I'm, we will change the topic after this so we can <laughs> end on a high note. But I just, you know, and it just these powerful moments that just come together. And then at the end, the end is really like the reflection. I did find it um, because I, I've, I used to, I'm trying to transition into being a more digital person. It's not very, it's not natural to me. Um, so instead of taking notes on paper, I've been taking notes in the search engine. Um, so I found it and I put it in the comments of the video. Um, the West Texas Review 2018 September. Um, I just explained that to you. But you <laughs> no. but well, thank you. No, I'm glad. Yeah, Wes says, yeah. So that's sort of that 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 would be the idea. And it's a lot of fun because you know, participants have the opportunity to just keep going with one snapshot. Like we'll brainstorm a bunch of them, and then you get to choose not in the beginning, but the one that you like. Everything is about the one you want to do. And you could stay on that, or you could create the next moment. Uh, you know, I've found that the reason I settled into this format was because I just kept getting bored. <laughs> I kept mm -hmm. trying to make my story linear and it just wasn't a linear story. It's also actually about um, bereavement. Um, and I just, the day-to-day -day stuff wasn't that important. It was the the moments. Yeah, sometimes it's just like, you reach, I know I reach moments in my short stories. I'm like, oh, I don't feel like writing this part. I want to write the fun dialogue. And so I'll literally <laughs> like write, like, okay, write that moment here. I'm, I really get bored with moments of pause and reflection. They annoy me. I love like the, let's get to like the, I, I don't know if you were like this as a kid, but like if my teacher gave me a book we were supposed to read, I would flip through the pages to find out how long before I got to the dialogue. <laughs> That's if I saw like one paragraph after another and like the page that I would be like, I'd be so bummed out, like, oh man, I have to slog through this. But the dialogue is like the meat, you know? Yeah. I love that. I was just thinking, um, I get bored with reading that stuff too. You're absolutely right. It's, <laughs> it's not, I mean, not every time, like some people write some beautiful exposition, not to not to say they don't it's not to say that you're not super skilled at it whoever you are um but yeah I mean I, I also just tend toward the I want to see something I've never seen before yeah side of things for sure that that's and that that's the fun of writing those things Oh, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> uh, thank you for the warning. I'm glad that you didn't get any on me. Uh, <laughs> in, um, in becoming, in becoming an author in, in your, I don't know, literary coming of age, um, did you, did you start out writing about families or did it, did it come to you as, as a later part of a process? When I was a little, little kid, um, I did write creepy stories about a girl sneaking out to the cemetery in the middle of the night and that kind of stuff. Like really, you know, very predictable stuff. Um, but my first, yeah, I, I definitely was, again, very influenced by David Sedaris. And I wrote a lot of stories about my family members. That is where it all started, but it started from a place of humor. 
And I think that that was just the safest way for me to write, although that also got me in a ton of trouble. Um, but I have a lot of short stories published, nonfiction about my family. Um, if you ever are interested, if you go to idaslelian.com and you go under nonfiction, this everything on my website is published. Um, read Liar Liar. Just, I think it'll make you laugh. And that's where, that's where I started. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I always have. I really love stories with character development and I struggle with plot. Um, but I think I'm finally striking a good balance between both. That was my challenge as a writer. Yeah. Yeah, they're different beasts. I'm always sort of shocked when I see both in the same piece, in the same like book. Uh, I think maybe in, in short form, it's either more forgivable or easier to do, mm -hmm. either more forgivable to not do or easier to have both because you have just a smaller container. Oh, absolutely. Ooh, one second. You're there good. we go. Okay. I was like, I can keep talking. Uh, <laughs> once a week, I do this alone. So I don't interview myself, just to be clear. <laughs> Might as well. Um, cool. Yeah, no, when I was, uh, I love I love that you were, you were telling stories, writing stories when you were a little one. I love hearing that. Every once in a while, somebody will say that they like started in college. And I'm like, wow. You know, I... I played music in, in the city for a really long time. And so I wasn't like writing it. My first published story in my life was in 2008. That was like my first, and it was in Pen Pusher, which was a UK publication. But I played music for a really long time and I did not take writing seriously at all. Like as I did not consider myself to be a writer, like at all. So I guess it's just different for everyone. I envy people who just, that's all they did. But in the same breath, I was writing because I was writing lyrics and I know music is a totally different mode, but I was writing music and I was writing lyrics. But to say I really sat down and wrote, it wasn't until yeah, 2008 when my first piece was published ever. I had someone on the other day to talk about story in ceramics so I am not really one who's gonna ever say that some some genre is not writing <laughs> um I did not realize that we were um on an on an hour now do you mind if we keep going I have a couple more questions sure, that I wanted sure. to get to yeah as long as your viewers aren't bored with well, my they can pause and come back if they're busy <laughs> um okay so did you start storytelling before you started writing them uh no no I just started this like a, like last May was the first time I told the story live. No way. So I was teaching it in the classroom for a while because I teach public speaking as well. <clears throat> I teach public speaking, creative writing, AP psychology. I'm doing 20th century culture and lit this year. But my point is, one of my um, units in public speaking, after persuasive and informative, is storytelling. And I was teaching it for over and over and over again. And I even taken my students to the mall. But I'm just like, why am I not doing this? I guess I should do it. And so last May was the first time I ever did it. And it was in Astoria here in Queens at a place called QED. And this very nice young man by the name of Matt Stores was kind enough to just be like, yeah, sure, you can come up here and tell a story. Like he just booked me. It was crazy. And I had about 10 minutes, 10 minutes could feel like a long time. And I told a story and, you know, and I've been, you know, I think I've done it about five or six times live and I really like it. I really like it. I, uh, I, I love storytelling. That's my, I have another job in which I teach storytelling as oh. social activism. Um, so it's it's very cool but i i was thinking you know um my first place i interacted with armenian culture was through storytelling um and i don't i don't know i 
that's that's where I think of it first is like the or- oral storytelling tradition. But for you, it's um, it wasn't that. That's so cool. Um, well, how what made you decide to make that jump? I feel like as a writer, it's a good challenge for me to figure out how to, to, it's like that oral delivery of how to do that. And it was, it was really great. It was so, I liked, I like to be, I really like to be challenged. Boredom to me is like kryptonite. And I'm like, how, you know, and every time I practice it, I'm like, no, I should take this moment and move it here. And wait a minute, this story really isn't about this. It's about this, isn't it? Well, then, then I have to go back and I have to add this thing. And it's just like, it just feels exciting. You know, it's so like, it, yeah, it's a it's very like, different muscle. It is. It's like taking Zumba after like weightlifting. Yeah. You know, you're like, this goes here. No, this, I can do this with it. And it's kind of, it's very cool. And, you know, all those years that I performed live music, like I played guitar and I sang and they were all original songs. I was terrified every time I'd go on stage and I do it anyway. And this, and, and sometimes I would play I had this, I have this friend, Oliver, and once in a while we would play shows together and he was just like a fierce beast. He just went up there and he was just a rock star. And before a show, I'd be like, aren't you terrified? He's like, no, he's like, I can't wait. And I was like, man, this guy's crazy. I'm terrified. And the reason I like it is because it is a confidence booster for me because I'm actually in front of people and I know what he's talking about now like I tell the story better when I'm in front of people which is mind-blowing to me I love it it's very weird I don't know yeah performance is different I don't know (laughs) I um I personally I would so much rather be in front of a bunch of strangers than any amount of people I know um (sighs) but like when I do these videos alone, I'm just staring at my reflection saying, um, every third word. And it's not fun. And no. <laughs> I like talking about what I talk about, but it's really weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's crazy, though, that uh, I, I, it seems like storytelling would be the natural connector between musician and writer. But it, it didn't happen that way for you. That's no, cool. not at all. It was so recent. So when you talk about uh, which, like, reorganizing, rearranging your your story, do you write your stories out for performance in advance? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, do you mean, like, handwrite them? Is that what you mean? And no, whatever writing means to you. Yeah, no, I mean, especially if I know that I'm delivering it and I'm scheduled and I have 10 minutes. No, like I just practice it over and over again for days um, until I nailed it. And, you know, maybe twice a day, every day until the performance. But I never write it down first because it's a nice break from having to write it physically down. Sorry, I know I keep looking that way, but I live on a a really seldom used road and like three people drove by and it was a surprise um <laughs> yeah I used to do that I used to I would I don't know I lived far away from things and I would just practice during the car ride too which is not, not the most reliable place to practice because <laughs> things happen when you drive you have to keep your mind on the road um, oh, yeah. but it's a useful it's a useful venue for practicing Oh yeah, it is. Okay. I, um, I wanted to make sure I got to storytelling, but I think we can, we can cut off here. I'd love to have you again. I do have more questions for you, but maybe I'll just ask them later. (laughs) Um, so for, uh, first of all, thank you for being here and, um, I'm going to move into updates about the Midwest Writing Center and then, uh, free write. I think because we've taken, well, I'll message you. I'll ask your preference. Uh, (laughs) So what's up at the Midwest Writing Center? This weekend, we have the workshop Poetry of Pop Culture. It's titled Things About to Disappear with poet and professor Gwen Hart. Um, 
And then, of course, next week, you can join us for the Our Culture Ourselves store, uh, workshop with Aida Zalel- <clears throat> Zalelian. And uh, I will be there. I will be excited about it. I'm actually, I've missed now my first two workshops with the Writing Center in years. The um, the one that's ongoing currently and the one this weekend with Gwen Hart. I won't be at. I'm really sad about it. I love, that's like the best perk about working here is I get to go to all these workshops. <laughs> um, but my schedule didn't work out. So um, then once a month and through February, April, and March, for some reason I don't know the months of the year um we'll have a workshop with Ada Ida sorry um that'll be the our cultures ourselves telling family stories and snapshots I don't I clearly don't have the titles in front of me um we also have on we're ongoing accepting applications for the great river writers retreat that's open to writers in the midwest there's a five state cap on that which I don't know off the top of my head because I am the most prepared person in the world <laughs> um for february and march we're returning to in-person writer studio sessions so we're going to continue to meet online via zoom and so the online group that meets with me will continue to meet online um, from 11 a.m to 1 p.m central time but for folks interested in get, getting together in person for those workshops um that will be happening at the midwest writing center ground floor of the rock island public library from 11 to 1 um those those hours are are tight there won't be um there won't be a lot of leeway in in how long uh you hang out if you're hanging out at the library because it does close um but yeah i really love my group the way that we work is um we want to know what you want out of your work and we're going to help you get to that place rather than giving you input based on our own taste um yeah, so that's our regular workshop group coming up next week, next Tuesday for Write More Light. We'll have guest uh, guest host Ava Miller. Super excited about that. Y'all are in for a treat. If you don't remember or unfamiliar, I've had Ava on before. I don't know words. I've had Ava on before to talk about horror. We did a Halloween special in 2021. Um, that was a lot of fun. If you want to check in on Ava, Ava's a, a former intern and um, film studies student at St. Olaf College. So um, that's stuff to look forward to. What else do we have? Iron Pen is coming up at the end of February. That is our 24-hour writing contest open to anyone. Um, you'll have to pay attention to time zones, though, if you're not from the Midwest, if you're not from Central Time. Um, so Friday night, 5 p.m., we give you a prompt, and then you have 24 hours to write it. So you have to have your submission in by 5 p.m. on Saturday in the categories of fiction, nonfiction, or poetry. It's $10 to enter. All entries um, are entered into a chance to win free tuition to the Collins Writers Conference. I can't yet announce who our faculty will be, but I promise it will be really great. And I totally forgot to say, I don't think I've even told you this yet, Ida, Um we have a really generous um, opportunity with Legacy Book Press, which is a local um, publisher that publishes memoirs. We'll be giving away two scholarships to your family stories class. Um, they have a contest. It has guidelines um, for that opportunity, but I will make sure to link that. Otherwise, you can look up Legacy Book Press for information on that. Um, Jody, who runs Legacy Book Press, is always looking for a new memoir. Uh, so it'll be a good opportunity to both get in touch with Legacy Book Press and to take a really cool class. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot to say that. I was thinking it. I was like, keep this in your head and make sure you say it during the during the show. And oh, I didn't. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, that's really generous. I'm really, really excited about that. Jody's really cool. That press is really cool. Um, I think that's my updates. I always go really, really fast and I never bring my calendar, which is why I'm trying to digitize so I can look at something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move into that, that free write, which I didn't send you my, my question. Usually when I go over time, I give the prompt and then I go, um, I've got an extra five minutes. It's okay if you need to, to go on with, with your life, but anyone who's hanging out with us, Thank you for hanging out. Um, stick around for that prompt, but please 
um, like always, write more light into your life. So prop time. Quick. Um, <laughs> ready? Okay. Think of a conversation, maybe recently or long ago that you had, that you wish you could do over. Go to the moment where things went wrong and rewrite that dialogue and make it the way that you wanted that conversation to go and end. That is your prompt. I will type that into the chat. I'll put five minutes on my timer. Ida, if you have to run, I understand, um, but I'm gonna do that prompt right along. Well, I don't know how to work my phone. I'm so sorry, everyone. You have a Luddite running the show. Um, but I'll put that prompt in the chat. I've got five minutes on the timer. We'll hope that I don't jump out of my skin when it goes off. I'm just going to mute and, and uh, I'll, I'll be back. Give me two minutes. I'll be right back. I'm going to stay with you. I was gonna type up the prompt, but I'm going to copy and paste it. We'll get it right if I do that. Two minutes left.
That is five minutes. I'm going to finish my sentence. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I don't know if I'm prepared for this prompt. Like I, I read it when, when you and I, um, exchanged information to do this and I was like, wow, what a great idea, but I didn't process it. And then I was sitting there like, I'm going to have feelings. <laughs> ah. um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am really, really excited. I was already excited for your workshops, but um, you know, now having met you, I'm more excited for your workshops. Uh, if you, um, if you, you know, need anything, want anything from the workshop, or I mean, from the writing center, you want to. Um, you know, spread the good word or, uh, you know, share your knowledge. We are always here for it. And, um, well, I'll let you speak if you have anything you want to add. Uh, otherwise I will end the, end the, end the live stream. Okay. Well, whoever was able to join me, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the prompt and thank you so much for this interview. You're a great host. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, to everyone hanging out with us, write more light into your life.